long session, but I can assure you it was, it's worth coming back for this one. What we are going to have is an exciting session where we are going to have highlights on perspectives from communities and representatives. When you are arranging this uh, workshop, one of our main aims was to bring in voices from different sectors. So we've been able to listen to academics, we've listened to people from the private and public sector, we've looked at uh, people who work in the ground, but now we'll have an opportunity to listen to voices from families, from people right in the ground. So, and this is a very innovative initiative that was set out and been implemented by two fabulous young members of the forum, Charlie and Jocelyn. I would like to invite them to invite the panel for this session. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Jocelyn and I would like to invite to the panel um, four members who made all of these videos possible by facilitating our visits. So if we could please invite Joan Kahn from Restavec Freedom, Christine Mutaganswa from Partners in Health, and Bete and Lale Demike from Project Mercy. So this is one of the new uh, innovative uh, activities that we're bringing to the forum. As Amina mentioned, when we are conceptualizing this particular session in Hong Kong with a few of the planning committee members, um, we had really set out to bring some diverse perspectives to, to this particular workshop because of the family and community investment piece. So um, with innovation obviously comes uh, some challenges. This, this, these videos were collected as late as Friday afternoon. So we've, we've put them together and uh, been working until the last minute to get this together. Um, but I think that's an important piece of this, is to be able to bring in near real-time information into these sessions. Um, as we've mentioned, and as Anne mentioned in the earlier part of the workshop, we're a learning forum, we're a global collaborative forum, so you can see we've got case studies from Haiti, Rwanda, and Ethiopia. For those of y'all not familiar with uh, some of the locations and work we've done in the past, um, our third workshop was in Latin America, so we'd like to continue the momentum, continue the global dialogue. So we have Joan Kahn here representing Restavic Freedom in Haiti, um, as well as representation from the region. So this, this session, as Amina pointed out, is really important of lifting up the voices and bringing the community into this room. So that's what we hope to show you today. How do I make this go? Oops. So our approach, we, just like the forum, we look for an integrated science across health, nutrition, education, and social protection. Um, our efforts, Charlie and myself's efforts, are really about documenting the continuum from policymakers to the impacts on the ground. Um, our sites are, most of them are identified by forum members. We have a selection criteria that we've, we've been working on this for about three months now, and many of you in the room were instrumental in helping us identify these sites. Um, and Charlie and myself really seek to experience the components of this policy to implementation continuum through the organizational lens. So the agendas, the itineraries, all of that has been established by these individuals who gave an incredible amount of time during our visits. Some emergent themes that have come up. Um, we talked some of the, about these in Hong Kong that really, I think, um, legitimizes this effort. And what's important, because we're talking about family and community investments, it's important to think about this as kind of a systems-based approach, a very closed loop uh, idea and all of these themes are, are critical to the community piece. So you'll see in all of the themes how, how all of them reinforce the other. Uh, it's very holistic. All parts of the system are necessary. All of these themes are necessary in these communities to make these projects um, successful on the ground. And one of the particular themes that I want to highlight is um, the idea of attrition. Um, so you see the picture on the ground about saying yes to the next generation. One of the things that we've been particularly struck by through this effort is the idea of young influencers, which is the topic of our next session um, on poster sessions. So you'll really hear that. You'll hear that voice, you'll hear that perspective, you'll hear the investments that these groups are making in the next generation, and you'll be able to see the return on the investment. 
So a, a short guide to watching these films, they're between seven and 10 minutes. Um, there's three of them. Again, the objectives of the session were to bring in a diverse um, um, viewpoints, diverse perspectives. We didn't have to work very hard to get that diversity. I think um, Gary and Amina and Simone, when we all sat down to plan this session in Hong Kong, we talked about um, children with disabilities, mothers, single fathers, those different types of perspectives, and those, those all were not very hard to find. <laughs> and these, all of these individuals are working among those different perspectives. So these themes, we highlight the players, the partners, the issues, both at a macro and a micro level, as well as the approach to the issues on the ground. And we really try to lift up the voices and how these problems um, are, are conceptualized in terms of a future agenda. So with that, I'll introduce our first video, which is Restavik Freedom, um, Restavik Freedom Foundation, which we, were, we visited in late June. And um, it was, this, this organization was established in 2007, so just ahead of the earthquake in 2010. The central location is in Port-au-Prince, although they're starting to establish a community-based program in Port Salut, which is in the so southwestern part of Haiti. Um, and the mission is to end child slavery in Haiti in our lifetime. So Maya, would you go ahead and play this? So one of the, the teams of Zukutak is the fight for what we call children restarted, which means uh, stay with, this is the word for the children that are slaves. And why I choose that, the methodology, is it's a very complex issue and that impacts all the country and many, many Haitian families. And that is, it is in the culture now to have children at home and it seems like it's nothing, not a big deal, nothing important. And why this methodology instead of just giving messages, it's because we have the possibility to do a lot of advocacy through this kind of methodology. But uh, we start a Freedom Foundation, we would like to see how we can change the life. And, and this way, we work with uh, churches, with leaders, with, com with uh, our communities uh, to see how the best way we can change the message. Okay, so we're going to play the video. Um, the change of behavior or of someone that starts with a, a very bad behavior and then changes his mind or her mind but all the process why what are the issues involved why causes that what causes that what can someone do to change it what we have is the knowledge of the Haitian culture the knowledge of the language of the communication acting writing but the main issues we talk about the right behavior to to uh, promote is really the work of a group of experts on uh, children uh, slavery, on the right children's rights, and also in the, the, this um, soap we're working on, um, family planning, sexual education, 
So we create what they call a values grid, and it shows, it names the bad behavior that uh, we want to change, and the reasons, the solutions, and the good behavior that we want to promote. But we don't decide ourselves what good, what is good is bad. This is based on the research and what's happening in the countries, on the programs that are, all the uh, big institutions are working on, the Ministry of Health and. Uh, um, and all the organizations that are um, concerned with those things. So we work closely with the advisory committee that is made of only experts on those things, and this is how we create our dialogues and we can be created. Because this um, methodology asks us to have 70% of entertainment and only 30% of messages. I'm very excited to talk about uh, the the hours, the transitional hours, yeah. it's very exciting for me to be in this hours. In this hours, we have 15 girls, 15 beautiful girls, and they are very strict. Uh, we have seven staff, two securities, and five women. We have a mommy, she's named Mommy Again, she's a really good mommy, and she's uh, it's just our mother. This house is very amazing for us. I I I wish the others, the other children, and the street would have a better place too. Um, they will be comfortable. They will have someone to take care of them. And this house, we go to, uh, we go to school. We have a job like we write books. Uh, the books they um, write the books and they sell them. We uh, we make art. We make necklaces. The house mean a lot of things for me because I'm in a good place. We have a lot of people that's not in this good place. I'm gonna talk about the Jenica Sing for Freedom. <laughs> It's a book that cuts your way. Jenica was a girl that living with her auntie and her auntie doesn't treat her really good. And then you know, like when a person is in this situation, they're like, even though they have something they can do and like they can sing or they can do something really good, they don't even like, they don't want to prove that because like, Someone always used to say them, you will be nothing in your life in the night. When they hear this word, they always think it's you. This painting is representing the Sabbath Freedom Foundation. And in this painting, we see our ex is our wolf. Um, first of all, at the same time, it's, it was a wolf ex. And there is two children who live in a uh, There's two children inside the ex. Inside the egg, and they don't have a family, someone who take care of them, they don't go to school, they don't have someone who pay attention uh, with them for them, and they, it's like they don't live. But uh, one day, um, we started to um, come from the foundation, just passing the way, and they see the eggs, and they said, Oh, look at the beautiful egg. But they just take it and they open, they work a part of the egg and they they saw two children, a boys and a girl, and they said, oh, look, and Mom June said, we need to help them to go outside of the, of the egg, because in this children, this, this place, this place is not really good for them to leave. We just, we just need to put, you know, put them outside. And she worked a part of the ex and she gave um, them school. She, they have a family, someone who take care of them. They have someone who pay attention to them, like me or not. And they go to school. They have food. It's like they feel like they are the real, a real person. It's very important to give the kids in Haiti the better life because it's not very good to treat very very bad the kids in Haiti because they they they, uh, they create with uh, the image of God after 10 years we're going to have a, a new Haiti with a new kids with a new families because they have a new mentality 
I think that this way of doing things is really impacting people because we've had feedback, so we know that now, but also because it's non-threatening. We tell a story. We tell a story everybody can identify to. And this is where it can impact people because every person that listens to it knows somebody, sees himself to it, or and doesn't feel threatened because we're not telling this is what you do. This is what so-and-so does and this is how so-and-so changes for their life. And you have the choice and the responsibility to, to do the same. If my dream is to be uh, a psychologist, uh, I would like to, um, to help children. Like, there's a lot of children who are in trauma and they, they are this physically and mentally too. But I just want to help them. This is my dream. This thing, this girl this would be, girls. Okay, this girl would be the busy thing of 80 and we are 15, we gotta help her to, we gotta help her to cook all the all other the eggs. Eggs. Yes, all the eggs and those children will be free. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So that was Restavec Freedom, and we want to wholly thank everybody who participated in helping us create that video. Um, before I move on to Partners in Health, I would like to introduce Yisak Tafir. Um, in my haste to get the session underway, I neglected to introduce him, and he will provide a research reaction after all of the videos. Okay, so now we're on to Partners in Health, who was established in Rinkwavu, Rwanda in 2005. Of course, they began in Haiti, but they opened a new branch in Rwanda. Um, their mission is to provide a preferential option for the poor in healthcare. And in this upcoming video, we have multiple perspectives. We have a head of the hospital, a nurse, a mother, a social worker, and a program director. And these viewpoints um, are spread across two programs. One is the All Babies Count initiative, and the second is the Pediatric Development Clinic Program, which you'll hear about in the video. Which started now since one year. So we help uh, uh, children with some potential threat on their life and uh, the clinic uh, is set to consult those children in the presence of their families, their mothers. So the second uh, program is ABC, uh, it is All Babies Account. Uh, it started in 2013 uh, uh, in collaboration with different levels from the Ministry of Health and our administration at the district level in partnership with partners in health. Since the Pediatric Development Clinic program started, change has been made in Kayonza district. I worked in the pediatrics and neonatology ward. When we discharged premature babies, their mothers did not come back for checkup. Nowadays, patients are very grateful thanks to the program. The role of the program is focused on the child's growth and to prevent them from any health issue. I suggest that this program should be applied in other areas. Most women used to marginalize their children if they had disabilities. In fact, they were considered as moronic. Thanks to the program, women have changed their mindset by understanding that all children should be treated equally. I would like to mention that the program's services should receive support because of their significant role in our lives. I am a social worker at Rinkwavu District Hospital in the Pediatric Development Clinic Program. My role is to teach women and their children in groups. I teach women depending on the age category of their children. For example, I teach about malnutrition. We also have toys that we use while playing with children and teach women how to play with their children. We also teach them to breastfeed their children. Afterwards, we provide counseling to women who suffer from depression to improve their living situation. 
After a group session, we do one-on-one -on -one meetings to have a deep conversation and provide particular advice to improve living standards. In addition, we do provide porridge. Afterwards, as social workers, we go on home visits to verify if the home is clean and make sure that the mother is correctly providing milk to children to gain weight. We have to provide milk to some women who have given birth to twins and are not able to breastfeed their children. In conclusion, many women have stopped from being lonely thanks to the program that has helped them to meet with other women who are facing the same challenge. When I gave birth to my child, he was born tired. At three months, he had strength to lie on the stomach. However, at nine months, my child could not sit. Whereas at the age one, my child can work. I help my child to practice sport thanks to what I learned in the Pediatric Development Clinic program, which allows him to sit and eat. Whereas at age one, he could not sit. I used to think that I was alone with a child born malformed. However, it was very helpful to meet other women with the same issue. Now, my child is two years and three months. As you can see, he is able to grab something. Moreover, with my help, the child is able to sit and walk. I am looking forward to seeing the child walking without any help. All babies count in Hindu and Hesikate, program manager in uh, one district in uh, the rural country, uh, working uh, with the government, with the Ministry of Health. This initiative was combining the effort for the Ministry of Health and the partners in health uh, to try to reduce the neonatal mortality, uh, which was occurred uh, in those two areas, which is the Kirehe district and uh, the Kayonza district. Uh, those initiatives tend to have three main components, which are the mentorship and, the, and training, which consists the formal training, and the training by on-site job training, which commonly help the staff whom we met at the health center. The third component was the quality improvement at the site or at mentorship site, where at the end people tend to come by culturally basis to present their quality improvement and their share peer, it's like a kind of peer-peer learning where they learn each other on what they did, what best had been improved. We had many indicators, um, where included the ANC coverage, including the attendance of women for four NC visit, and the checking of danger sign. All those things, all those indicators are there to tackle and to reduce the neonatal mortality, which now had improved. This is uh, a, a, a good program for the community because we think that women who saw many babies die while they, are, they reach the facility or they receive the care which is not good, they, they saw that this program had improved, but we, we've seen a, a huge decline of and, um, 28 days babies and we hope that this can be a scale up for the whole country wants it to be sustained. But also we think about uh, scaling up those programs at uh, other health facilities. For that, uh, we need to measure the cost we invested in those programs to see if they are possible to, to, to run in different uh, settings. We can propose to those levels and uh, the programs initiated at this ground can be scaling up at uh, East African community, at African level, why not uh, at uh, American level also. So that is the long term vision of those programs. It is not only to help the local communities, but we need to share with the entire world. Thank you. Thank you also to everyone at Partners in Health for hosting us and facilitating our visit. 
Um, so moving on to Project Mercy, um, it was established in 1977, apologies for that typo, um, and it is settled in Yetibong, Ethiopia, which is about three hours south from here, um, and their approach is a holistic one in a fight against poverty. Um, and in these videos, you will hear from community members who have worked to give in-kind contributions to Project Mercy. Um, they weren't all able to contribute financially, but they were able to dedicate their time, their labor, and their energy. Um, you'll hear from fathers, from mothers, from children who went to Project Mercy school, and also from a small child who cares for her older relatives. And you'll also notice a life cycle approach in these videos. Um, the students who go to Project Mercy School become doctors, nurses, and teachers who return to the community to teach the next generation. Maya? Elvis Freya Simba brought Marta and said that people in the area are illiterate. Let us open a school. This entire area was community farms. The local people said we will get the land. Let the school be open so that our children do not remain illiterate. We want education to start. Then the community was told that the community would have to pay to educate their children. The community said we do not have any money. Therefore, we cannot pay for the school. However, we will contribute our labor. Whatever the work, we will contribute and we will do. All we want is for our children to become educated. With that agreement, the school was built and opened. I had lots of challenges with my children. I did not have anyone to watch the children. So I was both their father and their mother. I came to work and they asked me what my challenges were. And I explained that I was caring for children that do not have a mother. Therefore, I was having lots of challenges. So they asked me to bring the children. The children were very, very small. I carried the children and gave them to the project. After that, I took a job. And after that, the children have grown. They have finished 12th grade and they are ready for work. The organization helped raise my children, and they have helped them to reach where they are. Through my employment here, I have been able to get myself together, my own clothes, my home, and everything is now in order. Has managed to meet the minimum development goal four, which is about child, reducing child mortality by 2012. Uh, in 2012, that's a that's a major achievement for the nation. <laughs> Our mother, our father, what they have done for us, we cannot repay. Without differentiating men and women, all those that did not have jobs have gotten jobs. All those that did not have livestock got livestock. Our children have gotten educated, and some of them are now doctors. May the Lord bless them for their work. May they live a long life, both our father and our mother. May the Lord bless them. And what we owe to them, may our children be my name is Kidane Sarko, and I'm from Yetabon, Ethiopia. Um, so when I was a child, about seven or eight years old, there wasn't any school in my hometown, Yetabon, Ethiopia, which is three hours south of Addis and about nine miles north of a small town called Butajara. Um, so I have two older sisters and parents, 
So my two older sisters and my parents, they never got a chance to go to school because there wasn't any school. But when I was old enough, when I was about seven years old, Project Mercy came to my hometown, Yetabon, and built a school for us. It wasn't easy when I was going through grade one, you know, from elementary to high school. One of the reasons was, you know, my parents, they didn't understand the importance of school. So they would rather um, have me at home helping them, you know, fetching water or collecting firewood, you know, or helping at the garden. So, but I had to. So for us, just learning was just amazing, something to be able to read and write. You know, I really like real education. I really wanted to learn and even to be first in the class. So I would study so hard and ask my teachers. And I was like very happy to do homework. Then the government placed me to go to attend law school. Um, here in this country, the system is different. You don't, you don't, you don't have a choice to, you know, where to go. You don't have a choice what to study. The government just would say, oh, what's our necessity, you know, what's our need? So I attended their, um, their law school for three years. It is a five years program, but I didn't want to be a lawyer, but I didn't have any choice. So until I got a choice, I would just keep going. So when I finished my first year at law school, I came back and I don't really want to, you know, keep doing this thing. I really want to study medicine and I really want to have patience, that's my passion. But it didn't happen, so I was just, I went back to the second year, did the same thing for the third year, but I said, not, not anymore. So in 2011, I volunteered for a year at Project Mercy. Then I went to America and I attended a biology pre-medicine uh, program there. And I also did a minor in chemistry and also do some, you know, public health classes. So now I'm happy what's happening with myself, but but I, I still have the passion to be a medical doctor, but I, I also appreciate public health, especially the holistic approach of public health. You know, it's not treating a single person, a single patient, not fixing something. It is addressing the root cause of the problem. Is that like clean water, what, that sanitation, that nutrition, whatever that is, public health is a holistic approach and it is preventing something from happening or or addressing if it happened right away so that it won't be a major case. So I'm, I'm really happy now I'm going to attend Vanderbilt University at Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I'm doing a master's in public health, um, focusing in, in global health. The government is working to, I mean, the establish a continuum of care service from community to facility level through a conditional uh, referral system. But that system is not as such uh, strong in this country. Uh, the health extension uh, program, which is considered as a flagship program in the country, mainly for the rural community, where over 80% of the people lives, uh, is making a significant change in improving the awareness level of the community and providing disease prevention and primary medical care at the community level. But that program needs to be strengthened through uh, training, motivation of health extension workers, proper supervision and monitoring. I would like to emphasize the role of faith in traditional leaders in the country. I mean, as I said before, Ethiopia is a religious nation, over 96% are religious attendance, and faith leaders are highly heard at the community level, even more than the government. But these uh, important groups are not well uh, aware and mobilized for the well-being of the nation. We need to work on faith leaders so that they will uh, get the right awareness and be mobilized as an important agent. Our lives and our future have become brighter. Before they came, 
when we used to carry women in labor to Butadria, they used to die on the way, and we used to bring back their dead bodies. Today, we have a hospital. We have a school. Since then, there is nothing that we lack. We live very happy lives. Our children have been educated and have become teachers themselves. Other children have become doctors, and others have become nurses. We have nothing that we lack. May they live a long life. So, you know, my passion is to help my people and my community, but I also want to, you know, do wherever the door is open for me. So, yeah, so I really want to come back to Ethiopia and serve my people, and especially I want to be part of the part of the Ministry of Project Mercy. Just a wonderful, a wonderful organization. Whatever that is, I don't know that exactly, but I know for sure uh, I want to serve um, my country and my home and, and any country in Africa or wherever. You know, humans are humans. You know, people are people. You know, my passion is to invest in people and to see others. You know you know, be in a good place. Like, I have siblings, I have friends, you know. You know, I, I, want, I want that, you know, problem to be changed and I want them, I want to see them in a good place, you know, being an engineer, being a doctor, or whatever that is, and just to be, you know, to be the future leaders of Ethiopia, you know. Um, I'm very optimistic, I'm very crazy optimistic. Um, I think Ethiopia is in a good track. Right now we are doing very well, but we have a long way to go. And I want to be, you know, a small part, you know, I want to be a part of that and, and, and I hope to see a better Ethiopia in the future. Thank you so much. Um, and to everyone who helped um, coordinate the videos and to everyone who participated in the videos. Um, one thing I would like to underscore is the importance of young influencers. That's one pillar of the forum's work, is to encourage the next generation of researchers, program implementers, and policymakers. And as you saw from Katya, who wants to be a psychologist, and Rosmirta, who thinks she'll be the next president of Haiti, um, to Kidani, who has interest in going to medical school and pursuing a public health degree. Um, these organizations are giving them that opportunity, so thank you. Um, and Jocelyn and I um, covered the community viewpoints, but we would like to give a few minutes to the program leaders to provide a bit more context and background on the programs. Um, and then after that, we will invite Yasak to provide a research reaction. So perhaps we could start with Joan um, on a high-level overview, and I think about three minutes per organization will do it. So thank you very much, ladies. Job well done. Um, it's my first time to see that, so it shows the trust I have in my young colleagues here. Unfortunately, Haiti has the distinction of being the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. So I could greatly identify with Dr. Coutinho when he um, talked about investing in the health of parents, because in Haiti, when a mother dies, unfortunately, their children are oftentimes doomed to a life of child servitude. And so that's what we are trying to uh, combat in Haiti. Restavec is synonymous with child slavery oftentimes in Haiti. It's endemic of many of Haiti's social ills from uh, poverty, illiteracy, gender inequality, gender-based violence, and just violence in general. We are working to change the cultural mindset of Haitians towards children, and particularly non-biological children. One of our current initiatives, as you saw, um, I'm not sure if you understood that well, but it's with the Brigade for Minors. The Brigade for Minors is the police department that works with minors in particular. And currently, Haiti has no uh, technological or digital approach to monitoring child trafficking or child protection. So we're working to create a database um, for the Brigade for Minors so that we'll be able to track children I don't know if you could see, but what they use right now is hard copy binders that they hand rule and they input data manually. There's no way of filtering that system. There's no way of finding a child that you might bring to BPM. And so right now we, we have been in the discovery phase. We're now in the design phase and we hope to field test next, next month. It will be the only um, database of its kind that exists in Haiti right now. 
So we're very excited about this project. It will also help us track perpetrators. It will help us um, with corruption issues leading to dismissing cases of violence against children. And so we're really excited about this. So thank you for having us. It's a great honor to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, I work for Partners in Health, and as uh, it, shown, it is shown in the videos, we have two big projects in our pediatric department. And uh, one, I, I liked the way the presentation was done. For me, it was from the end to the beginning. So maybe I will go from the beginning to the end. The All Babies Count is targeting the reduction of neonatal mortality in Rwanda. As you may all know, Rwanda is other countries are trying to decrease under five mortality, and we are on the right track, but the neonatal mortality is still a huge problem. So to try to work on that challenge, Partners in Health, in collaboration with the Minister of Health in Rwanda, have come up with an All Babies Count initiative, and it does not do any magic. We work from the platform that already existed since a long time ago. We focus on the four ANC visits. We're trying to recruit moms since they are early pregnancy and try to provide them with some information and also trying to address some of the health issues. But also, we enroll them in other programs. We have a, a program on social and economic development where we have patients becoming producers. So we introduce them to microfinances projects, livelihood and uh, stocks. We can give them some seeds. They can grow a kitchen garden. They can do some businesses from what the family does not, not, does not need. Let's say you grow enough vegetables to feed your family, you can sell the rest. So the other intervention is around safe delivery. We're trying to mentor the midwives that are already working in the district hospitals that are receiving all complicated delivery cases from health centers. So maybe I should mention that the way the health system works in Rwanda, we go from the community. Well, community health workers that are in charge of maternal and child health have some, they know some of the dangerous signs for both babies and mothers. So they can refer moms that are in danger to the nearest health center, or they can call an ambulance from the district hospital using the rapid SMS project that uh, the MTN, it's a network provider in Rwanda, has helped us you know, establishing. So the other major point we're working on is uh, what happens when a baby is born right away and also in the 20 days of life. That's the postnatal period. We, in the PIH supported districts, we have, uh, we try to culture the good practices and uh, some of the good practices are about resuscitation of the newborn, the kangaroo mother care and uh, when babies are discharged from the health center, we are trying to link them to the community so that they can do the follow-up. Just recognize the baby in respiratory distress or a baby with fever so that they can refer back to the hospital. With the PDC, which is the pediatric, program, pediatric development clinic, 
we've, come, we've realized that babies are surviving, so then what do we do? We don't have any structured way to follow them up. Not necessarily that they need to be seen by a medical doctor, or they have, they're having any clinical issues, but how will we know if a preterm baby is catching up, if he will, okay, most of them are low birth weights, but how are we following them up to know if they're not falling in malnutrition, or if their mothers are, thank you. Uh, to wrap up, those two initiatives are, those two initiatives are really foc trying to focus on what to do when babies are surviving, how do we follow them up? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we also want to say thank you to uh, Charlie and to Jocelyn. Um, we tried to give them some shortcuts. They refused all offer, so they did this uh, from the ground up. So wonderful job. Thank you. Uh, it's also a great opportunity to be here. Beite de Maka with Project Mercy. Uh, even though there are two of us, we'll try to keep this to three minutes. Um, just to, in short, Project Mercy was uh, started in, 1990, in 1977 um, by Marta Gabrazadik and Demaka um who are our parents, um, my brother and I. Uh, <clears throat> originally, uh, the focus of Project Mercy was actually around uh, refugee and famine relief. Um, which was really more in line with where, where our situation was uh, in the 70s because we were also refugees from Ethiopia. Uh, but um, uh, when we had the opportunity to come back to Ethiopia, uh, we shifted the focus more towards uh, community development. And as, as uh, Charlie said, uh, holistic community development. Uh, so in Ethiopia, we work in four regions uh, in the south, uh, Legatafo, just east of Addis, in Jaja in the Amara region, and then up in Shire and in, uh, in Tigray. Um, my younger brother uh, is actually the general manager of the Ethiopian operation, so I'll give him the mic to talk about uh, the, some of those programs. Th thank you again for uh, giving us the opportunity to come and share a little bit about what the organization does and uh, how, uh, in this case, young and <coughs> investing in young uh, children, um, how Project Mercy does that. We, the areas that we work in is education, health, infrastructure, food security, and community development. But everything we do revolves around education. Uh, that's our uh, bread and butter. And um, <coughs> when we talk about uh, investing in uh, young children, we, we want to start from the young children. Uh, so, for, so when we started the school, it started with kindergarten uh, to second grade, and as those children progressed, we added a grade every year. And uh, they, right now we have children that have come through our school, finished high school, have gone to some type of higher education, and giving back to their community roughly about 25 children that are back in the Yetabon area serving the community. Why do we do that? <laughs> the reason is very simple. If we can invest in our children from a young age and teach them the value of education and to give back to their community, then the community people can accept that and, and they'll take it in because it's not somebody from the outside coming in uh, to teach them and to tell them this is how you do it. It's their own children. So one of the young people that uh, you saw in the video, Kidani, he, he came through the Project Mercy School, <coughs> finished uh, high school and actually had opportunity to go to the U.S. for uh, pre-med. And when he's done, his plan is to come back and give back to the community. How else do we, uh, do we um, invest in our uh, young children? Not only do we uh, teach them uh, the basics of reading and writing, so on and so forth, we also teach them basic nutrition, and we teach them hygiene, and we teach them how to give that back into their community. 
uh, like I said, it's, it's, uh, like my brother said, it is a holistic program. We, we like to take the whole person. As a result, not only do we have uh, the education, we also have a hospital, a 52-bed uh, hospital. We have vocational for the adults. Uh, we have um, a health science college where uh, we are training uh, mid midwifery students. All of this goes back into investing not only the children, but also the community. Thank you. Thank you very much for those overviews. If we could invite Yasak to the podium to give a research reaction. I, I will be briefly explain what Young Life does and then we'll go to the next step. Uh, maybe Young Life, some of you may know that Young Life is a longitudinal study run by uh, University of Oxford, but uh, funded by the FID mainly, but there are also uh, supportive uh, um, funders. Um, it has been a study in Ethiopia, India, Peru, and Vietnam uh, on 12,000 children, and it started in the millennium. But we have two cohorts of children, those who are born in the millennium, and the other, uh, they were eight years old as backup children. So uh, we have 12,000 in four countries, but in Ethiopia we have about uh, 3,000 uh, study children. Um, just to give you, we have two methods. We use survey and qualitative studies. So the survey is very big, about 3,000 children and their families. And the, the qualitative is, of course, a very sub-study of it. Across um, five regions, 20 sites in the survey and five sites in the qualitative. So far, we have done four rounds of qualitative and four rounds of uh, survey studies, and we have some substats on education, on social protection, on OVC and other studies, uh, more on, on education. These are the sites we study. Uh, just, as you can see, we are at the center because, as you know, longitudinal study uh, should reduce the attrition rate because in the final analysis, after 16, 17 years of study, then you have to have a good number of children that they have to have some conclusion. So we were at the center of the country then when there is accessibility, when there is less mobility of uh, the, uh, the children. Uh, we have a lot of research outputs. Uh, I think we'll, I, will, I will show you the uh, website, but I don't have to take you your time just to, to explain what we have. Uh, so let, let me go directly to the reflection. <coughs> I think I have seen them three of uh, the, the transcripts. Um, we have some relationship, some things that we, we met in the field, but we have also some things that we, are, we may ask. I mean, maybe those people who are involved in the project may have some response later on we will discuss. Uh, the Haiti um, project, I guess I saw that it's very important project. Uh, it brings the community, the wider community, the families, and of course a small project. But uh, there is a good relationship with us because in our study we do children, parents, community leaders, and the government officials. So we do the whole research then how it is involved. Um, let me mention one case, which is Janika, that there is abuse. Because in our longitudinal study, we have found that there are some of our children have been some abuse from, not only from outside, but also from families. For instance, if I take one example of an, uh, Asanu from our one side, the, she was working since the age of 10. She was working for paid in irrigation. She was living with her uh, grandparents because her, her parents have died. Then she was doing a lot of work in the family outside for the income. But at the end of the day, uh, when she was grade six, she was not cope with it. And she had to marry by herself. And she has just uh, been avoided by the family and she is living on her own. There is a cultural aspect that without the interest, I mean the consensus of family, there is no marriage because there is a lot of transaction involved in it. So she is not in a good term with the family. So there are abuses that like a, a, a child from Haiti. Um, there was a mention of painting. I don't know, I will be asking later on. If in young life we use 
participatory uh, child research methods, uh, drawings, uh, paintings, but I don't know whether this has been done. There is a dream from the children, from the girls we have seen at the end of, we have a child aspiration, what we call. One point I would like to discuss is that whether in the children are living in poverty, in third world or developed world, they have aspiration. We have found out that against some findings from the West that children in the living in poverty have also high aspiration. What they lack is the opportunity to, to achieve them. Um, in the Rwanda, it's more of medical thing. I have very few reflections on it only, but there are two things that we have found. First thing is we have healthy extension workers in Ethiopia, which have brought a lot of change in the families, in the mothers and children. For instance, and in the second round of our qualitative, one of our mothers died in childbirth because of it was very far from the health center, but since then, Every mother is getting birth at the health center, which has uh, a, a good development. Uh, going to the Ethiopia project, I think that I see two parallel things. Our study is a longitudinal study, and I think this project is also a longitudinal project because a boy who has been grown or just supported by the project has come back again. I don't know if there was a research being done followed specifically on this project, then I think we will have very long eternal story uh, from this project itself. Uh, what is important is, is, yes, enrollment is high now. As Kidan has said, that there is a change, but the dropout in the quality is a concern now. Um, Kidan's story tells a lot of things. Parental need for child work, which in our son, I have a child work. Uh, transition to high school is very difficult because you have to go to town and there is a lot of expenses there. Aspiration is high, but opportunities, options are left. Not only for unsuccessful children, but also for successful. Those who join university, there are some limitations that you cannot realize. So, lessons, there is challenge in school. Broader national poverty is limiting individual achievement of aspiration. Children agency in, uh, in pursuing dreams. Kidan has shown that he's following his own dreams, so there is a possibility children's agency is there. Methodological, as I said, biography is important of, uh, within the project. Uh, maybe as a final reflection, I think the narration are based on projects. In young life, we don't do on projects, but the household level, but also, we included some projects in, in our study. The scope is not good, involved children, community leaders, mainly religious, but also health experts and others. Children's voice is good, which we do, because our qualitative research is purely based on children's uh, expression of uh, their lives. But methodologically, I think, from this reflection I have seen there is ingredient for systematic approach. Holistic and longitudinal size of children's lives through children themselves. Can we do that? I think I, I understand that it is from out, uh, out of the scope of the projects, but it is important. Scaling up. In the morning there was one, uh, I think one presentation. Do we start from practice to research or from research to practice? So, small projects can help us generate real life of research, then we can scale up it in a bigger ones. So these are questions I think we would like to, to, to talk. Uh, I would be happy if you will visit this website and just have your own reflection. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. First, I would just like to take the opportunity to thank uh, Charlie and Jocelyn for bringing to us community voices and the project leads who have had a fabulous contribution in explaining the projects further. Now we have the opportunity to take questions. You could address the questions either to the project leads or Charlie and Jocelyn. I think we will start by taking three or four questions and then we get the responses, then take another set of questions. Okay. Do I see any hands?
Thank you very much for bringing the voices of the community of children, fathers, mothers, project uh, workers into the room. Re really greatly appreciate it. I think it's something new for, for the forum, and I, I think it, it was really fantastic. Uh, one of the questions that I would have, uh, and, and it was pointed out in the research reflections, is that um, it's challenging for one organization to have a large reach. H how do you think about expanding your reach beyond the bounds of your particular projects? And, and the, the particular people that you're directly serving. How, how do you think about that? And does that enter into your program planning? Okay. Thank you very much for those presentations. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you're outreaching to fathers and encouraging more male involvement in the lives of young children. Okay, uh, let's take those two questions first, and I think they're general enough that anyone from the table could respond and another one adds to, the, to that. Uh, thank you for the good question. Uh, for us, we started in two rural district areas, but now the government is, has liked the project and because we've also shown some improvement in the neonatal survival, and the Ministry of Health now is scaling up the protocols that we've developed on neonatal resuscitation, on uh, how do you check the emergency trolley every day in, mater in a maternity ward. You know, those are being scaled in all the district hospitals in the country. We have a presence in all 10 departments of Haiti. Primarily, we've been able to expand through social media like the um, radio soap opera, and through that, we incorporate the UN, all kinds of people, the government are involved in that, and our advisory committee. So we have expanded greatly there. And when we first started, we asked people, who do you take advice from? Who do you listen to? And the primary answer we got was their pastor or priest. So we started working through a coalition of, of churches and parishes and voodoo practitioners to try to see if they would help us disseminate information. So that's been an incredibly valuable piece of being able to get information out quickly, influence people um, through churches and, and parishes. So that was something we had not anticipated. Uh, the pro Project Mercy approach is uh, a little bit different uh, than I think uh, a lot of organizations. How, how we go into a community is we ask that community what it is that they need. For example, in the southern region when we started, the community asked for two things. The first thing they asked for was a clinic. The second thing they asked for was a, <coughs> a, a school for their children. Well, what we discovered was in order to have a clinic and, and in order to have um, a school, first we needed infrastructure. We needed to have roads, we needed to have water, we needed to have electricity. So that's how that community development project was born, not from what we, we aspired to do, but what the community needed. And that's how we expanded into different parts of the country. As uh, For example, in the judge area, we have the cattle breeding project. That is because that is the, the milk and the butter belt for the country and that's what the people wanted. So uh, the way we'd like to expand our reach is to uh, pilot these programs in areas and once they become successful, we hope to replicate those in other areas. Honestly, what Project Mercy would like to do is not be needed in a particular area. Once, because once we're no longer needed, that means we have accomplished in wiping out poverty from that area. So I hope that answers the questions. Uh, I think we've not yet addressed the question on paternal involvement. So if I would request just very brief comments on that from the panel. Uh, it's quite interesting to see when we practicing the kangaroo mother care, I'll give that as an example, for the neonatal survival in the words. Now fathers are asking why is it called kangaroo mother care? Why? not kangaroo father care, because also 
they are carrying the babies on their chest when mothers have to take a shower or have to do something else. So it's now becoming, it's entering in the random culture. Normally moms will there for their babies. Fathers will you know, be on the field or farming or catering, but these days they are also involved in the neonatal care, so they are now asking for some names to be changed. I think it's a good thing. It's a good sign. Thank you. Okay. Any, okay. We uh, primarily involve men in sexual education. Um, while women are very much involved with this decision, we felt like men needed to be educated on this as well. And so that's been a very interesting part of our work is having men participate along with their wives or their girlfriends or whoever in this particular program. Uh, we also do that through a justice curriculum that we created. Um, men are very involved in that and out of our studies we would uh, predict that there's about 80% of men that participate in those justice curriculums. Any further questions? Any other set of questions? Yes, uh, there's a... Thank you for these wonderful examples. Uh, Teresa Betancourt, Harvard Chan School of Public Health. I wanted to say Murakoze um, Chani to my colleague from Rwanda. And uh, I wanted to ask a question about where ECD is located in terms of ministries, um, because I know you're working with the Ministry of Health, and they've now moved ECD under the Ministry of Gender and Family Promotion. And for the different countries, I'd like to know if there's any influence, depending on who has the obligation to coordinate ECD across ministries, if you see differences in different countries. Uh, for Rwanda, the ECD is in, uh, in our pediatric development clinic. We're working closely with UNICEF. Well, by we, I mean, partners in health with the Ministry of Health are working closely with the UNICEF to develop an ECD, an early childhood development kit that we can use during the education sessions that are being provided to moms and their children when they are coming to the health centers for the routine follow-ups, but also Part of the ECD kit that's being developed now will be also, we have a component of co the community, well, what will mom do when they go back home? Because we know that babies are spending much time with their moms. They just come for a checkup once a week or once a month or once a quarter. So we, we want to have those two components. What's, be, what's going to be done at home, and what can we do as a clinician. We already have uh, ages and stages questionnaire that we, which, well, we do routinely after six months. At six months, 12 months, 18 months, and two years. But those are not really enough. And when we can have toys at health centers, but when Moms and their babies go back home, they leave, the, they leave the toys at the health centers. So that doesn't really give us the quality that we would like to have. We're hoping, by the, we're hoping that by, you know, by August, when we'll be having the new ECD kit, we'll have those two components addressed. Thank you. Maybe I will ask a question to Charlie and Jocelyn. Mine is mainly much more methodological. So you spent quite a lot of time traveling and meeting communities, and you've done a fabulous job of bringing us voices from there. From the point of view of involving communities more in such kinds of workshops and forum, do you think this is an adequate approach? Is there a way you would have improved on it? You know, just a little bit of reflection on your experiences, you know, and what more could be done or, yeah? I think we first thought of that issue when we were in the Amazon in November and we saw some of the different materials that the um, home visitors had brought to the mothers 
And we recreated our interactive infographic using some of those materials, and Kimber has it. Um, so I think, you know, really thinking about our products and the communication strategies. Um, I, I'm not sure we mentioned it, but I think, I think this is, it's about 1.5 million people in Haiti that watch or that listen to the soap opera. Um, so it reaches an incredible amount of people, and you're looking to, I think, scale it up um, and, and reach people in communities in Miami. So thinking about these practices that are very, very community-based and how to ground what we're doing in those and, and, and bring our products, you know, bring, bring those practices to, to the forum and not you know, always focus so much at the policy level but the continuum. Um, in terms of bringing the actual voices to the workshops, um, we would love to bring everybody who we interviewed here if we had an unlimited budget. Um, but since we don't, video is, is kind of the way we went. But we do hold poster sessions to engage younger people. Um, so it's important, of course, the research, of course, the policies. But if they work on the ground and where they come from is very important. So I really appreciate the community voice. And I know Jocelyn um, also enjoyed our trip. Sorry, one more thing, but I think it's really important if we can think of ways to engage the people we've, enga we've interacted with so far and keep them engaged. We had a good group in India um, that, you know, it's, it's a challenge, but I think thinking of ways to continue to engage the group in Brazil and Colombia and now these groups as well that we've brought here. Thank you. And I think also just listening to the presentation, sometimes actually even thinking of connecting these different groups people who are doing similar work using slightly different methodologies but have the same aspirations would be a nice way to use this network to increase impact. So uh, I would like to thank everyone who has participated in this session. May I join you to, uh, let's clap for them. It's been... <laughs>